Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 297, featuring a special interview with Mr. Brian Fargo of In Exile. Brian's on the show to talk about the Bard's Tale 4 Kickstarter, tells us all about the project, and answers questions submitted by viewers. A lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Brian Fargo. All right, folks, I am here with the great Brian Fargo, the CEO and founder of In Exile Entertainment, uh, formerly of Interplay, a developer of the original Bard's Tale uh, series, or uh, Tales of the Unknown Volume 1, I, I guess is the proper title on that. Uh, he's here today to talk about the Bard's Tale 4 Kickstarter project, which I assume you've probably heard of. They were asking for a million and a quarter. Uh, they just reached uh, 1.3 million uh, with... Over two weeks left to go, uh, so that's pretty exciting. Hopefully, they will they will reach some of those uh, stretch goals. Anyway, Brian, a lot has happened since the uh, last time I had you on the show. That was back in January in uh, January 2011, if you can believe that. I, is, has it really been that long? I, I do remember the conversation we were talking about a, a speculative wasteland. So uh, that was kind of fun. Yeah, that was before any of this uh, Kickstarter stuff, if, I, if I'm correct about it. I don't, maybe it was out and we just hadn't heard of it yet, right? But, you know, would you, did you imagine back then all this stuff that's happened since? Uh, no, I mean, it would have never have occurred to me, and I wish it had back then, to say, rather than say, you know, forget pitching publishers. Just go to the fans and go, hey, you guys want this? Maybe you'll help us fund it. Uh, never really occurred to me, and uh, and so yeah, I think Kickstarter was around, or at least crowdfunding. Well, crowdfunding's certainly been around a long time, uh, but uh, not to the scale that uh, it is now. Uh, so yeah, I, I would have never imagined this reality. I mean, I, I was out sort of uh, giving speeches on how you know uh, this kind of category is sort of going away, and everything was going to go to was going towards free to play or monetization, which was a very different kind of uh, discipline for me. When you're making a game, when you're solely focused on how to get money out of their pocket, it's a different experience. And, and so I just didn't see a way for making this kind of game. So yes, I didn't see it coming. Uh, I wish I had, but I'm sure glad that it did. Well, what's this uh, Bard's Tale 4 Kickstarter looking like uh, from, from, your, from your end, uh, Brian? Does it seem like it's going according to plan or is it not exactly where you want it to be? What are your thoughts on it? Uh, no, I mean, uh, let's see, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly happy with it. I mean, here we are, we're, we're funded. We have you know, 30,000 people have backed it so far. That, that's a pretty huge number. And, uh, you know, I think that, uh, we, there's some, been some bigger Kickstarters recently in terms of numeric dollars that people like to compare us against, but you have to keep in mind that they're, 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 they their, uh, focus is a little more on console. So they're you know, they're selling sixty dollar cost of goods where you can get in bar sell for twenty or twenty five bucks. So you know you'll you'll see like our backer numbers are not that far off, but the dollars are less. And so if you compare to that, but but I don't look at it that way. I mean we've got thirty thousand people. We'll probably end up around two million dollars at the end of this, um, and uh, that puts us in the top what fifteen video game kickstarters of all time. Harley can complain. I think of course we're a little bit spoiled from torment you know, lighting the world on fire there on that first day. But so you got to kind of get your head out of that. So no, no, I'm, I'm very happy. I mean, we're funded and we're off to the races. Yeah, I was I was a little surprised myself. You had mentioned uh, Torment Tides of Numenera. Of course, that hit 4.1 million, I think, by the end of that. And then Wasteland 2 was almost 3 million. Just so close, right? Yeah. Uh, I would have thought that Bard's Tale would have had no problem easily topping either one of those two. It seems like it's a much bigger franchise. Uh, at yeah. least it seems that way to me. So I, I don't really know what the... I mean, there's still time left, right? But I, I was expecting, uh, I guess, more fanfare. Oh, you know, you can armchair quarterback some of this stuff. It's hard. I mean, part of it is, hey, we're in the entertainment business, which is never 100% uh, reliable in terms of your ability to project. Uh, but also, um, you know, it's an older game, too. You know, you think about... I, I think that with Torment... Uh, it was much more in people's mind. It was a late '90s product, and then, of course, with uh, with Wasteland. While that was old, you had a lot of people who were Fallout players, right? That, which was more recent. So Bard sells very old. So, so I think that you know we're reaching back much further on something like this. And and there's some speculation that this type of game doesn't have. It didn't have people in it, you know, per se, right? Personalities. And so I think mm. people tend to focus towards uh, whether it was Planescape with Morty or Wasteland with the original crew, Snake. 
uh, Snake and Angela Death and all that, right? That there's no, there was no character personality per se. It was all more driven. But look, we could all guess on this stuff, you know. Uh, it's also, you know, a function of timing. I think that uh, E3 was a is is a difficult time to be in the middle of a campaign with. Well, you have E3, Steam Summer Sale, GOG Summer Sale, and then people come out of E3 and they announce Fallout 4, and they're all on Amazon pre-buying it, and so we're basically up against Christmas sales at the same time so that's that made it a tough week for every kickstarter across the board but but again i mean i'm not really complaining here don't get me wrong well in retrospect would you have chose a different time i i don't know every time has its uh, pluses and minuses uh you, you could have gone after e3 but then you go into the summer and uh that gets pretty tough especially in europe as everyone goes on vacation so there's arguments against that uh, could it, if we'd gone two months ago, if we were ready, yeah, that probably would have been better. But you know, you just got to work with what you got. Well, I really one of the things I always like about your Kickstarter projects are the the pitch videos that you put together. I mean, they're very entertaining. Yeah. You know, uh, but I'm kind of curious who who is the kid in these videos? Is that Ryan Fargo Jr. that we're looking at? Uh, no, you know, on on that one, we decided to hire a real actor for it. Um, I don't ever know where to look at the camera or you here. Anyway, um, uh, 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 for a real actor, because um, I knew I couldn't act. So I figured I, if I got one that could, I, he could kind of bring me up to, up up, uh, up a level. But yeah, that kid is great. And uh, for me, he's supposed to, he sort of epitomizes everything that people don't like about executives in the business and, and their outlook. And so he's kind of fun to write for and quite easy, too. Yeah, he just totally nails that, that persona. Yeah, he does. Exactly. Well, do you, I mean, do you have other tricks up your sleeve for the next couple of weeks? Any? I know you got the uh, the kilt photos. I was looking at those and the uh, that really uh, I was, that RPG song. Uh, we love our <laughs> RPGs. I mean, was that something that you guys planned, or that what's the story behind that video? Yeah, that was kind of my baby. I I I I, I said, you know what? I, I heard the song. I want my you know MTV. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's just too perfect. So. I, uh, I talked to Nathan Long, and I said, hey, you know, why don't you write some lyrics? And I thought, well, who can perform it? And then I had worked with Gavin, you know, Miracle of Sound Guy before, and he loved it, and so the whole thing just came together. So that was that was very much our effort. And um, what, was your, what, was your, what was your first comment question? What, it was you, uh, I had some point I was going to make. Anyway. You, oh, you, did you have some more tricks up the sleeve? Oh, yeah, 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 yes. Of course. I always have tricks up my sleeve. <laughs> Yes, yes, we have we have some more stuff coming, and uh, we we held some stuff back during E3 week too because we knew that it would be lost and the press wouldn't be listening. And so, if you'll notice this week, we've been we've been we've been going pretty strong. We we had a pickup of you know almost 10x on a daily rate from from last week, uh, and that you know we did that loyalty program, which we basically said, hey, if you backed us before uh, on Wasteland or Torment, here's a bunch of free stuff if you'll back us on Bard Cell Four again. Because you know the way I look at it is you know we've got. 30,000 backers, and I'll make up a number here. I'll, let's say half of them are new and half of them are old. Well, between Torment and Wasteland, there's like 100,000 people. So there's like 85,000 people, 100,000 unique people, 85,000 people that backed us on those projects that haven't backed us on this one. You know, let's, let's, you know, let's appeal to them and also give them something cool for doing so. That's a great idea. I need to go back and look at my, uh, my pledge rewards. I think I got the, well, the box copy. Super collectors or whatever. I don't remember the yeah, yeah, right. details on that. But I can't imagine it getting much better than that. Uh, have you had people well, that look, uh, have I look, shrunk? I look, that, shelf, I look at the shelf behind you. You have to have physical goods. <laughs> yeah, I have to. That's <laughs> okay, how can you do digital goods? It could have been 500 bucks. I probably would have found a way you know, to get that. But, you know, I guess if, you know, if I were rich enough, I'd love to have that $10,000 package. I mean, that was <laughs> – yeah. I don't know. Do people actually take you up on those, or is that just kind of theirs uh, – what do you mean? Like the ten thousand dollar pledge? Uh, is anybody pledging at that level? Yeah, well, my mom bought one. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. We have like four or five, don't we? Yeah, I think there's four or five. We get them all of them, and our first one had like I think ten. You know. Wow. And by the way, you know, you you just made me think since you've been such a great supporter of RPGs over the years and a good guy, we're gonna send you the Reliquary box for free. So. Oh man, that is done. awesome. All yours. You don't have to buy it. <laughs> In fact, it's right here. I got I got the only one in existence here. See, it's pretty cool. Look at that. Hold on a second. There we go. Look at that. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Yeah, it's really going to be nice. And this is not even wow. Different. So, yeah. Anyway, we're going to send you one. All right. Uh, I'm kind of speechless about <laughs> recover a little bit. Well, if anyone deserves it, it's you. 
Uh, thank you. You've been a really uh, stand-up supporter of uh, the show as well as an executive producer. I think you were one of the first ones to sign on. You know, I, I like that you are trying to keep the history alive and accurate for the for the category, and uh, you know, because otherwise this stuff kind of gets lost to the lost to time. And so I think it's great what you're doing. Well, thanks, thanks a lot, Brian. Okay, uh, so anyway, uh, uh, back to the uh, Bard's Tale Four for a moment. <laughs> uh, so one of the things I was intrigued by, because you know I love role playing games, but I also really love adventure games. And you had mentioned uh, one called The Room uh, on iOS, and I looked into that. And I haven't played it yet, but it, just looking at the screenshots there in the videos, it kind of reminds me of uh, Mist and Riven a little bit. I don't know how accurate that is. But I'm just wondering, uh, how far do you want to take it in that direction? Um, well, I, I definitely think you should check it out. Those guys did a wonderful job with it. And uh, it, it's not like the mist in terms of you traveling over this sort of expanse of, of an area, everything's kind of more micro contained. And so, you know, I found myself where I started playing the game and it was just, you know, you'd open a chest and then there'd be a dial, you'd switch and you hear a click and then you'd go around the other side of the chest and the a compartment would open up and then you'd find a key and you put that over here. And it was like, it was so satisfying. And I, and I got to be thinking about, you know, in terms of, like the Bard's Tale has always been about riddles and puzzles, mm -hmm. and and I like the way they handled it. And I just found that just the physical manipulation, the virtual physical manipulation of things, the way you would move and things would click and open. I just thought you could do so much with that, especially within a role playing game. And so it just really kind of turned me on. And so we started talking about ways to incorporate that, not just in the puzzles of the world of you traveling around and solving things, as I like that, but also down to the items themselves. And you might, we did a kind of a video on our Kickstarter page where, you know, like you have this sword and you've had it the whole time and there's like a little dial on it and you, you can move it around but nothing ever happened. That finally you get some clue about perhaps how to line them up and you, you line them up, click, and all of a sudden, you know, the thing whirs around and now poison starts stripping out of the blade. You think, oh my gosh, I've had this poisonous blade the entire time. I love that, you know, and, and so it, it's um, it's something that we can do where we telegraph it and let you know, and there'll probably be other parts where it's just purely upon discovery, you know, or, you know, you, you have some sword with a hilt and you drop a gem in it, and all of a sudden the sword glows blue, you go, whoa, I didn't know that. You find a different color gem later, it's for you to figure out. We may never tell you this stuff. You drop it in and the sword glows a different color, has a different effect. So I think that sense of, you know, because you know, exploration and discovery is a big part of RPGs, and so when you're traveling around the world, that's sort of a macro version of it. But if you can do it down to your inventory, you know, it's like a micro. It's almost like a, when a scientists look up at the stars and some of them look down in the telescopes. You know, it's a little bit of that. Hmm. Yeah, I just, for some reason, I'm thinking about that in Bard's Tale 1 where you go into the tavern and, and buy the wine, I think, and they show you into the cellar. You know, I can yeah. imagine, like, you get the wine glass and you don't really think there's anything special. But then after you drink it, maybe at the bottom of the glass, there's a little, you know, clue. Right. <laughs> or a key or something i don't know well you know it's it, it's yeah it's all yeah it, 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 that's a good example of, a, of where you you know you you, you don't you think and you look at the bottom and you go oh my gosh right i mean yeah so that that's that's what's fun i think that's great because you know a lot of these role-playing games you almost get in sort of a mindless trance playing them and i think these sort of features would make you step back and really pay more attention to these items and uh, the environments that you're in and everything so i'm really i'm really excited about that uh, what about the uh, your 2004 uh, Bard's Tale game? Is there? I'm, I'm a little. I don't think it's going to be uh, following that uh, that game. But I'm just wondering, are there going to be connections to that? Hey, I told you not to ask me about that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, um, no, no. That was listen. We 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 were in a kind of a funny mood, and uh, that was a well. That that came out of a out of three different things. First of all, I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually quite proud of the product. I mean, it, it's, it's a very funny game. Yeah, it's got that great drinking song. Yeah, it? It, you know, but it wasn't, it wasn't your, it wasn't an RPG for the hardcore at all, right? So I get that, and people were kind of expecting something different. But it, but it had so much character and personality, and I think that was in the writing and the voice acting was great. Uh, but that came out of the function of that, one is that the only monies that could be had back then were really, you had to have a console product. So, you know, that kind of dictates a certain kind of game. Uh, we also uh, wanted to use an existing engine, which was the Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance engine, and that dictated a certain kind of game. You know, tools weren't, a, you know, weren't what they are today. And then uh, thirdly, 
was that we didn't have the, the rights to the copyright for Bard's Tale, so I had to do something that didn't infringe on the first three. And so that, so you kind of add that together, and then, of course, I guess the fourth part is I, I was playing a lot of role-playing games in my spare time, and I kept having to do the same tropes over and over and over. And I thought, wouldn't it be funny if the character played the game as if he himself had played too many role-playing games? And so that's kind of how it was born. Yeah, I like the humor in that game. And I hope we'll see at least a little bit of that uh, in the yeah. new one. Well, just that whole, I love the whole opening scene. You, know, you think about all the emotions in that for the first 10 minutes. You know, it was, it was the bard with his lecherous comments. It was the people uh, tricking him. It was him getting pissed. It was them laughing at him. You know, there was all this great emotion that all happened, and which was, you know, that, which was kind of the goal to, to, to not just be, you, you kill a rat in a cell, you come up, thank you very much, you know, here's your gold. You know, to, to, to take it, to make fun of it, go way beyond that. Well, how do you compare this uh, Bard's Tale 4 with the Legend of Grimrock series? And I don't know if you've played the Might and Magic 10. Uh, how do, how's it going to compare to those games? Mm, gosh, I don't know. I mean, I, I played I played some Grimrock, and you know, I, I think those guys did a nice job with that for sure. I, I think that uh, I don't know how to compare, but I guess you know, our you know, in this sort of dungeon crawl, right? I mean, I've always loved this category. You know, first it was Bard's Tale, it was Dragon Wars, it was Stonekeep. So clearly, you know, I, I've had an, an affinity for it. And you know, our the things we have in common are obviously we're focused on exploration. Where it's focused on, on on combat, you know, sort of this non-linear world design uh, that we like to do, and so in puzzle solving. So those are the kind of the, the tenets of the game. Um, I'm just trying to, like, if if dungeon exploring is going to be a big component of it, I, I look at it and say, okay, there's been all this incredible technology that's been done over these past decades. You know, you look at the Unreal tech. Uh, stuff that NVIDIA is doing or AMD is doing and all these plugins and and speed tree and all this great stuff to bring all the latest tech together and do something really so that visually when you're walking through it looks just outstanding uh, and, and 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 one of the advantages we have is that because it's a you know they like to use the word blobber now which is kind of funny but as you're as you're walking around in in this landscape uh, or interior or exteriors whatever you know, we have all this bandwidth to, to do a lot because it's not a multiplayer game and I don't have 40 enemies running around the screen. I have all the bandwidth to do something and you've seen visually, oh, yeah. you know, it looks great. And that's not pre-rendered. I mean, that that's, you know, we're running that in engine. And then it says we, something that people thought it was pre-rendered. I mean, it was that good. I, I know, I know. We, we got a lot of that. I know we got a lot of that. And then um, the, and then in combat, of course, is turn-based. Mm -hmm. So again, We've stopped, so visually I can do a lot because it's not in real time and we're not having to deal with a lot of real-time AI and things that typically, because you know, when you show engine demos, usually you, you show up, but then by the time you put everything on it, you know, it drags it down, but, but we're able to do a lot of these things by the nature of kind of the design. So, so, so that's a big, you know, that, that sort of visually stepping it up. Music is something I've always loved a lot. I've been trying to push the, I mean, I think, We've had song and dance numbers practically, well, maybe not dance, but we have had songs with lyrics and people singing, you know, and, and ever since Stonekeep and our Bard Still Comedy, and even even Wasteland 2 had a children's choir, if you remember. And so, and now you hear we hired Julie Fallis to do. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you, yeah, so, so that song, by the way, this is something that people don't know, is that that's the original Bard Still um, uh, um, song, you know, where he's strumming the guitar. I, I, I sing this. What am I, I can't remember. I see of a, of a cold and wintry day. It's like now the lyrics are popping out of my head. But we took that original poem, we expanded upon it, had it transferred into Gaelic, and then that's her singing it. So that's that's the uh, that's the original Bard Still poem. The song I sing will tell the tale of a cold and wintry day. Yes, it's all coming back to me now. So uh, so music is a big part of it, uh, and, and then just because that kind of creates the the, the ambient, and, and even it's going to be, be like. Uh, like they have these great like Scottish working songs where like like the women would be working and doing the laundry and they're and they're singing in cadence in order to keep up with the thing. So you, as you're wandering around the town, you'll hear people singing as they're doing their you know, as they're doing their work. So I just think I just love that aspect of it. Um, and then of course combat is going to be uh, uh, you know party based and uh, you know and 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 and, and phase based. So you know there's a, there's a lot of dynamics with what we can do and we want to spend a lot of time 
figure out how the characters interact, how they buff each other, and how things can happen. So that because before in the first games, you know, it was attack, 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 defend, hit, return. I think that that where you're sort of it's more interactive now. You know, my 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 mage casts a spell, and I'll I'll make up a an example that's perhaps a poor one, but but the, if it bounces back and hits him, you know, and he takes damage, well now my player in slot two who was going to attack looks at my mage who's injured and says I better heal now and so that you're changing your tactics based upon as you go down the line or go in any order you want we're not going to force you which order you go in either so so that you know the combat's a big part of it so it's hard for me to say how I, I guess I can only kind of describe what we're doing as opposed to how we're different or similar to them one thing that I was really impressed with was uh, you know I might you might be surprised maybe not but uh, you had mentioned or the Kickstarter mentioned that uh, you won't have to wait, you know, during the combat. Because you know, a lot of uh, games like this, you have to wait for these animations. And, I mean, once you've seen them a hundred times, you really don't care. <laughs> you don't want to see it That's right. yet again. And so it sounds like you've really listened uh, to some of the, you know, criticisms of those games. And we're going to have combat that's, even though it's phase-based or whatever, it really moves along at a, at a nice clip, would you say? Yeah, no, I, I think that's critical. You know, and we're, we're big Hearthstone players around here, and I, I once used that as a as a metaphor, which confused people, but it was really to focus on the cadence of the way combat works, because, you know, I don't know if you play Hearthstone, but, you know, you're, you're going, and you can even go before an animation has even begun or ended, and so you're just constantly moving, and so that sort of rhythm feels really good. That's why I didn't want to attack, 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 defend, defend, hit return, and then wait. It just, it just you don't want to be standing there uh, while nothing's happening for, for, you know, or at least minimize the amount of time you're kind of sitting there doing nothing. So, um, yeah. So, so yeah, absolutely. We we want it to move quickly. Combat has to be. I better be. It better move quickly, and I better be using my brain. You know, throughout. So it isn't mindless. And so as long as we're doing those those two things, then people will enjoy it. And then you had said that one of the stretch goals was the. I guess I don't know if it's fair to call it a tactical view, but and you were talking about how the camera might zoom out. You could see the characters there. Right. And come away from that uh, first person. Kind of reminded me of a battle chess. You know, that, that's for some reason battle chess yeah. popped into my head when I saw that. But uh, you know, what's the what's the stretch goal for that to happen? That's a good question. We, we're actually just working out those stretch goals today. Um, uh, it, it's definitely going to be up there for sure. And uh, it, uh, interestingly enough, some people say I don't want to see my characters. You know, they actually they don't want to see it, which is interesting to me because. Hmm. When you're in the character creation screen, everybody wants to see their character. I'm sorry, or, or, or in the inventory screen, right? Like, like I want to see my character in my inventory screen. When I get the shield, I want to see it on him if I can, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a lot more expensive than doing paper doll. So, but so in 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 a in a in, a, in, a, in the right budget world, I want to see my character in the inventory, and when I have items I buy, I want or, or find, I want to see it on him. So, if I'm already seeing him in the inventory screen, it kind of made logical sense for me that wouldn't it be nice to see him in the play field too, sure. right? Uh, so, so you know, it's, it's really still a combat. We just pull back. We're just rather than making you imagine it, you're getting to see it. That's the only difference. But tactically, it's exactly the same thing. But it is a lot more expensive to do because you've got to have all the all the uh, items created so they can go on the characters, and that becomes an expensive proposition. So, it's something I. I prefer to do, uh, but we'll we'll see. We'll we'll make that uh, decision later. That's one of the tricky parts with with Kickstarter is that you, two things is you you have you don't know what your budget's going to be, and, and so and then you also have to give a date kind of up front, even though you don't know what the what the uh, what the specs are going to be based upon that budget. So it makes it tricky, but we, we make it work out at the end of the day. But it's certainly a, a challenge. Yeah, it's interesting to think of how different the game might turn out depending on the you know the fate of the Kickstarter. Uh, one thing I was excited about too was the. It sounded like you're going to have a lot of gear, lots of slots on the characters, you know, which is something I I like. I notice there's a tendency in some of the console games to really simplify that process, almost to the point where you just have a couple of pieces, you know, to work with. But it sounds like you're talking about, <laughs> yeah. you know, everything you could imagine. I, I'm, I'm, you mentioned rings. I remember the old Might and Magic games, that you could actually have a ring on every finger. Uh, <laughs> up to 10. I wonder how far you're, you're really going to go with this. Well, I, I think you're right that we're not going to try to simplify things. I think that, you know, we actually did that with the Bart. Like, we had a, it's interesting how people look at this stuff. Like, for example, like with when we did the, the, the Bart still comedy or whatever you want to call it, we thought, you know, selling things in the store isn't that much fun. You know, let's mm -hmm. just, if they find something that's worse than what they have, let's just convert it to cash right on the spot. 
and not make him run back to a store. But lo and behold, people really didn't like that. You know, they liked to the manage their inventory and do this kind of thing. And, 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 and so it's sort of a play pattern issue. And so, you know, we're going to have tons of items that you're going to be able to, to again, you discover their properties, sell their properties, or be cursed or whatever. And so we're going to, I guess we recognize it. I don't know that we'll do a ring on every finger as an example, but but certainly we're going to drill down and make a lot of items you can find, uh, some of which will have sort of obvious properties and others you have to discover. Uh, one other thing about the, well, the, we're talking about the physical contents. Sorry, I'm jumping around a little bit here. Uh, but the code wheel uh, was something I definitely wanted to make sure we talked about because this, <laughs> you know, I guess love them or hate them, they're kind of a part of that early uh, role-playing game error, right? Of course, they were used for copy protection, I guess. Uh, but it sounds like you got very different plans uh, for the code wheel and, and Bard's Tale, right? Yeah, we're, that's more of an homage, and we're kind of having fun of a, of a place in time where code wheels existed. Yeah, that was, of course, before the Internet, So, because that would do you, like, zero good today, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's just an homage to people like you and me that grew up with this stuff and remember kind of the classic code wheel kind of thing. So as far as what we'll do with them, I, mean, I don't even know exactly what we do with it, but we'll, we'll, we'll do something where, you know, it has maybe some little hidden surprises and information and makes the game a little more fun, but certainly not going to be something where you genuinely need it, that's for sure. One thing I was also wondering about were the whether this game would just have one difficulty level for everybody. Uh, that, that would be pretty unusual, I, I think. You'd probably have more... I'm imagining you'll have the easy, normal, hardcore uh, sorts of things, right? And, uh, yeah, yeah. No, we, we, we definitely will because, you know, I mean, the original Bard's Still players, they, they like, you know, they're, they're you know, there's a, there's a group, I shouldn't say the original, but there's a group of people that like kind of the punishing aspects of, you know, not being able to save the game anywhere except for the Adventurer's Guild, and uh, why not, right? Uh, and then there are other people that, 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 that don't have that kind of time or, you know, or, or, or commitment. It's, a, it's, it's different than it is today, so we need to recognize that. So we'll, we'll have different, different difficulties, and, and we, may, we may also not just say easy, medium, hard, but maybe perhaps let you choose the variables that you want to have uh, be difficult or medium or on or off, so to speak. So we give you a little more, a um, uh, little more ownership over how, exactly the aspects you want to be have to be harder. And it seems like the achievement systems in modern games are a pretty good answer to those hardcore folks, right? So maybe you get some kind of achievement if you go through it without an auto map, for example. Yeah, 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 or, yeah. Or, or sometimes we may, you know, reward you. I mean, it, it could be, and I'm, I'm not saying we're going to do this, but if you only, you know, if you only have Adventurers Guild save, you get an extra ten experience points, you know, uh, for for your combats. I don't know. We could reward you for doing something, something like that too, and not just have it be an achievement. But I'm just, oh, just talking off the cuff. But, but I like reward. I, I in general like rewarding people for their risky behavior. Hmm. Yeah, I know you, you talked about how sometimes you would get into those dungeons and want to go just a little bit more, and then you die and lose everything. But, <laughs> you know, just having that possibility does make it more exciting. As long as you're blaming yourself, you can, you can, you're okay. All right, so just a few last uh, questions here. Uh, kind of fun questions, I guess, uh, from viewers, viewers sent in. Uh, one was asking, uh, you know, about the music. You know, have you got your music team selected already, or are you still open to some... Uh, some other performers they had recommended a, uh, a band called Blind Guardian. Apparently, they have a song. I'll, I'll watch their video. They've got a song called The Bard Song. I don't, know if, I don't know if you've heard of those guys. Uh, I don't know. I'll write, I'll write it down and check it out. Well, I don't know. I mean, we have we have we have some pretty good uh, music musicians and music directors on it right now. Of course, we have Mark Morgan. I don't know if you heard that. He took an old. I don't know if you heard the. Did you hear the song? We took the kind of the classic. Bardstell song, uh, a melody, and then he, and he got it. We transitioned over to a more modern version of it. I don't know if you've heard I'm that. Pretty sure, I heard that. I, yeah. I so, so, so Mark Mark's going to help do the music, and you know, of course, we have you know mad respect for him. And then we have uh, Jed Grimes, who uh, is big in the Scottish music scene. Uh, he's the bass player for Simple Minds, but we worked with him before also. Um, and you know, he's a very talented you know sort of uh, guy that's going to help us bring the Scottish music scene together. You know, for, you know, I, I found Julie Fallis, but there are other great talented Gaelic music singers and, and, and he's the one who helped with the idea I told you earlier about kind of the uh, the Scottish working song as the women were cleaning it. I mean that that was stuff that he 
he helps find and discover for us. So, um, uh, so we, we're kind of on the music side. I feel like we're 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 sort of in a good place. Yeah, I almost imagine. For some reason, I'm imagining almost a Renaissance festival like vibe. <laughs> you're oh. wandering around a village and you hear music and you maybe even see some jugglers or something. Well, that, that's what we want. We, we want we want to feel super alive, and mm -hmm. and, and those are just to me uh, just great tools for uh, giving a character. Okay, what about the the ale? You know, I'm a big fan of fan of ales, and I know uh, the Bard. You know, I read some stuff about the Bard will be constantly swigging ales. I'm just wondering if you might be uh, if you could say a little bit about how that might work in in the game, and also is there a, an official ale for the Bard's Tale? You know, I know there's a there's a company called Left Hand Brewing that has one. Have you heard of this? Uh, the Bard's Ale. Of course, we have some here. I've yeah. drank it before. I mean, <laughs> hello, I had to do that. I mean, the drinking drinking well, drinking is a big part of the game and this office. <laughs> so uh, the, you know, the Bard, just like in the original games, you'll have to wet his whistle uh, after doing so many songs. Uh, we 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 like that part of it. Uh, I don't. We don't have an official beer or ale yet, but certainly we probably will. Um, we have one with Wasteland 2 with Snake Squeezing, so I'm sure we can. Uh, we'll, we'll probably come up with something here. And anywhere we can give it personality, we'll, 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 we're gonna, you know, we try to do. I noticed you got a little something back there behind you there. I can't. I've been trying to make that. Oh, out. oh, this is the uh, uh, King's Crest. Uh, oh, is that a whiskey? whiskey. Oh, yeah. Wow. So, well, I became a bit of a whiskey drinker. You know, I, I went to, um, you know, I went to the real Scar Bray, as you know. When I did my Kickstarter video, somebody says we ought to really go there and record at the Real Scar Bray, which, by the way, was a great idea on paper. And uh, <laughs> we, on we paper. traveled a very long way, and it was very, very cold. But a lot, but of course, we had to uh, visit all the uh, Scottish uh, breweries. They call them brewery. No, what do they call them? Are they call them breweries, distilleries. distilleries. Yeah, yeah. Excuse me, distilleries. And uh, anyway, so I became a bit of a, a, a Scottish a whiskey drinker while I was there. Do you have a favorite? Uh, well, you know, I think that, you know the Highland Park was pretty pretty darn good. We got we got to go on a tour of the Highland Park, and they gave us they gave us a from a twelve year up to a thirty year aged uh, samplings of all their different whiskeys. It was fantastic. Oh, you're making me thirsty. <laughs> all right, just a few just a few last ones here. Uh, one, you know, a lot of people ask. What's what's next after Bird's Tale Four? Uh, will we see a Demon's Forge uh, Kickstarter? Well, well, I don't know what's next, but that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you that for sure. What about a new romance? I think, I think the Matt Barton RPG movie. <laughs> the Matt Barton. I mean, it's way from boxes. Yeah, that's but... way. It, that that one would have a lot of rats in it. Yeah, right. Yeah, you'd have hit, find the holy Skype camera. <laughs> Okay, so what about this? Is a Woody Gar asks, or do you have any plans to accept Bitcoin? Oh, um, I don't see why we wouldn't. Somebody told me that PayPal works with Bitcoin. I don't know if that's true. If I don't PayPal, know anything about so, it myself. Yeah, it, it, well, I'm not 100 percent sure myself. If PayPal works with Bitcoin, then we already do. Uh, if it doesn't, I know we, we we've uh, we've we've had this discussion before. So uh, I don't see why not. I just I don't. It's just been. You know, you're trying to do so many things with these campaigns, sure. you know, so many things. But uh, I know it's on a to-do list somewhere. All right, here's one from Michael Silva. Are you going to hire Chris Avalon now that he is available? Oh, well, you know, again, even if I was, I couldn't, you know, I wouldn't, this wouldn't be the, any, but <laughs> I, um, let's just hope that I, I hope to continue working with him on future projects. So, so the fact that he's no longer there um, doesn't make it harder for us to work together. Uh, here's Chris Freeman. Will it be? Will, will there be elves or dwarves in Bard's Tale Four? Uh, el yeah, yeah, elves, dwarves, trow, which is sort of a Scottish kobold, best way to describe it. Yeah, we just put. What? Are, how many different races are there, Chris? Was it? Uh, we just create, over seven now. I think there's over seven races and ten classes in the game. We we used most of the original Bardstow classes and then we expanded upon it. One of the things that, that people really liked from the first Bardstow games was this like the, the like the Archmage or the Geomancer oh, where that you, was awesome. level, yeah. right, you level up and then you sort of branch off into a new class and leave the other stuff behind. We like that and so we're going to be doing more of that but we're not we're going to do it not just for the for the for the 
spellcaster classes, but for all the classes. Yeah, that's a great idea. I'm really, uh, <laughs> I can't wait for that. Yeah, there's there's something to something very satisfying about having to you know get yourself up into multiple disciplines and then be able to become something else, mm -hmm. and then always wondering about what it would have been like if I'd stayed down that one path or not. So mm -hmm. it also makes replayability a lot of fun. All right, so just uh, one last question here. This is from Lars uh, Coke or Cock. I think it's probably Coke. And uh, this is not about Bard's Tale, but I'll go ahead and ask it. So, what's the new, what new feature of Wasteland Game of the Year Edition has you most excited? Oh boy. Well, let's see. Um, well, I'm going to name two only because they're so distinct. One is I like I love the voice work that we put into it. To me, like I think the NPCs that join you, whether it's Scotch Mo or or, or Dan the comedian, he's got. Their lines are wonderfully funny and well written, but you didn't get to hear them. So I think that's going to add so much person. Or the night terror and the voice actors we hired to do them did a, did a fantastic job. I absolutely love it. Uh, so so that's not. I mean, it's kind of a feature, but not. But I, I think that the uh, the uh, I think the quirks and perks I think are, are very funny and interesting and have the, uh, a way of kind of shaping the gameplay experience that's that's unique and very different. So I'd have to probably choose that one as a pure gameplay feature well thanks a lot brian i know you're a busy guy uh, so thanks very much for taking some time out for us here at uh, mad chat all right thanks matt i always appreciate the support oh no problem my pleasure i really hope you'll hit you know every stretch goal imaginable on this so oh that's the aim well we'll, we'll have we'll, we're gonna invite uh have some more exciting news on monday so i think that'll that'll uh even uh, infuse some more energy so until then you'll you'll <laughs> Oh, you'll find out there. Oh, the suspense. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with the second part of my interview with Mr. Richard Bartle. Uh, sorry if you who, uh, guys who were looking forward to that uh, this week, but I thought the uh, timeliness of the Fargo uh, interview made, made, made sense to me anyway, but... Uh, rest assured, we will be back to Bartle next time. As always, I want to thank you very, 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 very much, guys, for supporting me uh, and Matt Chat. If you have not supported me yet but would like to, I just go to the Patreon link in the show notes, and you can be supporting Matt Chat in no time and at whatever amount you feel comfortable with you think the show deserves. Thank you very, very much. Now, what about that news from the Matt Cave? All right, quite a bit of news uh, this week. Uh, first off, uh, Shane Stacks of ShanePlays.com, uh, a friend of the show, uh, he has put up a, or he's done an interview with Mr. Brian Bagnall. Thought I'd pass that along for you, a Commodore and Amiga fans. Uh, Brian is the author of, uh, I think it's called On the Edge, a Commodore 64 book, and I think he's doing some uh, work with the Amiga as well. Uh, but anyway, uh, go check that out. I'll post a link to it in the show notes. Um, let's see what else I have here. Uh, also, Shane sent a note about a game called We Happy Few. Uh, this is a really interesting looking game. Uh, it's being kickstarted right now from Compulsion Games. Uh, just watch the pitch video. I don't want to spoil it for you. Just, just go watch uh, the pitch video, see what you think. Uh, I was really impressed with that. And plus uh, that they have a beer tier. You know? <laughs> I hadn't seen that before, it looks pretty cool. Uh, also, David Beatty, another uh, longtime uh, fan of the show, supporter of the show. Uh, he's uh, he's in charge of this Mega Wars revival project, and he's got a 30-minute interview posted about that. Uh, so if you don't know what Mega Wars is, uh, go check that out. The video will explain everything, and I think you will uh, really be interested once you uh, if you don't know about it already. Uh, go check the video out, and I think you'll be very interested after it. Okay, let's see what else I've got here. Uh, also, Bethesda did something pretty cool uh, for a change, right? They uh, let a guy pay for Fallout 4 with uh, bottle caps. You know, of course, that's the in-game currency. Uh, so he had to send in 11.2 pounds of bottle caps, and I did some uh, some calculations on this, and apparently that is 2,374 bottle caps. So <laughs> uh, unfortunately, they said that they will not be accepting any more payments uh, of that sort. Uh, 
which kind of surprised me. I figured those bottle caps would be worth about as much as a, uh, you know, they got to be worth something, right? But apparently not <laughs> to Bethesda. All right, and then Adam Dayton, another uh, friend of the show, he has uh, posted a review of Serpent in the Staglands. He also earlier had interviewed uh, Joe and Hannah uh, about the game. So uh, I did a review of it pretty uh, recently too, but if you want another uh, take on it, go check his uh, Fragments of Silicon uh, talk show, podcast, radio show, whatever you want to call it. I'll have a link to the show notes to that as well. Ah, so I hope you uh, got a lot of news out of all that. And I think that will do it. Uh, what about that ale of the week? Well, come on, guys. What else am I going to be drinking this episode? Bards. Duh. Uh, it's actually kind of a tough choice. I went to Westside, and they had so many really interesting-looking beers there. Oh, my God. <laughs> they had one that was had this exact shirt uh, on it. Uh, let's see. Bards, the original sorghum malt beer. Bards Gold. Discuss it over a Bards. Uh, this is uh, kind of a weird ale because it's, there's it's no wheat, barley, or rye, or oats. It's uh, gluten-free. I'm normally not a big fan of the whole gluten-free stuff, uh, but what the heck. It's Bard's. Got to go with the theme, right? Uh, instead of being made with any of those, it's made from sorghum. So it should have a unique flavor. This is uh, brewed by Bard's Tail Beer Company. Uh, out of, I don't know why I said left hand on that video, that was a mistake, but it's, it's actually Bard's Tail Beer uh, Company out of Utica, New York. And I was looking on the bottle, I unfortunately did not see any alcohol contents listed, so I will have to guess. Might be kind of fun to take a, a wild guess at it and see how close I get. But anyway, let's get this Bard's open and see what it's all about. Alright, so I got some of this Bard's Ale here in the rather excellent drinking horn, also a uh, the, I'm going to save the bottle cap. I only need to get, what, 200 and, <laughs> 373 more of these. And I can get my own copy of uh, Fallout 4. I'll be damned. They, they will take that currency. Ah. You know, this smells uh, very, very, very citrusy. Almost like a, like a sun-kissed. Uh, have you ever had one of those sort of orangey sodas? I smell some sort of honey, a little bit, almost a little bit of a Belgian ale-like aroma to this. It uh, actually smells quite good. And I, I would note also when I poured it, uh, the sound of the fizz sounded more like a soda than, a, than you'd expect from an ale. It's quite, quite noisy, which I guess would make sense for a bard, right? Uh, anyway, let's give this a taste and uh, see what it's all about. <clears throat> I'm going to give it one more taste <laughs> before I say anything. Now, that is just not tasting like an ale to me. Uh, sorghum, huh? It's kind of a... tastes more a little bit like a really flat apple cider. Uh, actually, it's kind of what this tastes like. You do taste a little bit of a... An apple taste, a little bit of a citrusy taste. Uh, if it's got alcohol, it must be very low. Uh, I'm guessing something, well, it's got some alcohol, I guess. I'm guessing something like a 4%, maybe 4.5%. You guys can look that up and see how close I got. But uh, let me just taste it one more time here. And it's just it's very watery, uh, very flat, and you just don't really... You know, I don't know, I guess if you've got the, uh, what is it, celiac disease, you might drink this. Uh, otherwise, I think I would, you know, stay away from this. I'll see if I can find a more appropriate ale that has some kind of Bard's theme uh, going uh, forward, because I really hate the thought of these guys having to, <laughs> you know, drink this. Uh, just not not very good at all. I'm going to go uh, one out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, other than other than the name, and I guess if you do have that condition where you have to you you, ha you can't have gluten, uh, then fine, uh, go for this. But otherwise, there's a lot of other ales out there. Woo! All right, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And uh, I was looking uh, for quotations about uh, the Bard, and I found one, of course, from uh, Shakespeare, uh, which I thought was just perfect for a role-playing game. It goes something like this: We know what we are but not what we may be. See you guys next week.
was I drinking last night? <laughs> My head feels like there's a Frenchman living in it. 